started, and this is our practice. Uh, we'll start with a prayer from the saint of the day, uh, their uh, mass. And so the saint of the day, there's like 15 saints today. You might wonder, there are thousands of saints and only 365 days in the year. How do we handle that? And the answer is you have like 20 saints today that I had to pick from. <laughs> So let's begin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. St. Pantalon is the saint I selected. Grant we beseech you, Almighty God, that by the intercession of blessed Pantalon, martyr, we may both be delivered from all adversities of the body and cleansed from all evil thoughts of the mind. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. St. Pantalon uh, was born in the third century. He was a layman and was eventually martyred by the Emperor Diocletian in 305 AD approximately. What's interesting about him is as he's one of the early laymen recognized almost immediately by the Christian community as a saint because he had an interesting life. He had a Christian mother and a pagan father, almost similar to St. Augustine. And uh, he was just kind of drifting through life, uh, was nominally Christian, then fell in with the wrong crowd and led a wild life, regretted it, came back to the faith. And he was also a physician to the then emperor Maximilian. So he's an accomplished doctor for the time and physician. And he started treating the poor when he converted back to Christianity for free and set it up a clinic just to treat uh, poor people. So it's, it's another example of these early Christian saints who were innovators in the sense of creating the idea of a hospital. And then when Diocletian became emperor, uh, the persecutions were renewed with great intensity and he was not going to make the mistake he made again in his past life. So he sold everything he had and continued proclaiming Jesus, performing miracles, uh, curing uh, all kinds of diseases of the time. Finally was arrested and the question was put to him, will you sacrifice to the pagan gods and to the statue of Caesar? And he said no. So he eventually was tortured and then uh, crucified and then beheaded. Uh, and so the cures that continue from him, uh, as well as uh, there are vials of his blood that liquefy every year in the churches in Europe where they have them, like St. Januarius, if you've heard of, of him. And so his influence uh, continues and he's the patron saint of healing in body and mind. So a little uh, vignette on St. Pantalon, uh, who, as I say again, is, was a layman. Uh, this is how uh, impressed the people of his time were. So with that, why don't we jump in? This is our fifth class, our last one of the summer. So uh, some nostalgia, perhaps, in your hearts uh, for what has passed, or others just came for the food. But uh, <laughs> if we did a brief survey of where we've been. The, the theme of our uh, program this <coughs> summer was what's old is, what n is what's new in the sense of how ancient paganism reappears today in modern garb. And we spent the first couple of classes looking at a lot of those pagan cultures and their philosophies and how that has showed up again today in our time. We looked at the cultures that Christianity was born into the Roman world. And then last class, we spent time on why is Jesus different than everything that went before him? And we refer to that as the primacy of Jesus Christ and why that was significant and, and just changing uh, human history in, in those areas of the world that are influenced by that. We, the title of tonight is kind of a a look at today with more intensity and scrutiny and how we got to today, uh, particularly from a Western perspective. Uh, and 
I, I took a phrase from Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, in a work he wrote in, in 1994 called Crossing the Threshold of, of Hope, in that modern man, from his perspective, was afraid. And he's constantly saying in that uh, document, echoing the words of the Lord to the apostles, be not afraid. And we'll look more closely at what that means. So as we think of today, what's old is what's new, I've characterized this as a post-Christian age. And it truly is a post-Christian age if you consider what we've abandoned as it relates to our culture, society, our public policy making uh, in governments, federal, state, local. God created the universe from nothing as an ordered whole or cosmos. God's providence governs all events, and he is omnipotent. Nothing escapes his power. Man has dignity because he has a divine origin and a divine destiny. That's the source of his value. Something outside of himself gives him dignity as a human being. There's a natural law for all, universal for all cultures. And we have revealed the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. And these were very uh, obviously the pillars upon which Western civilization is built. The, the Judeo-Christian ethic is based upon Athens and Jerusalem. The arts. There was a time when the arts promoted the vision of what is true, good, and beautiful. And I don't have to tell you, but if you step in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago or other museums throughout uh, the US or Europe, you'd find that whatever else you thought that what is going on now is a departure from what was going on before. <laughs> so we've gone a long way from the masters, whether it's uh, Del Greco or Rubin or uh, beautiful landscapes or uh, portraying gospel scenes or just interesting scenes from history to what we see today, uh, whether it's uh, Picasso's, who, who kind of started some of this movement or some of the earlier masters. The, the vision of man has changed in terms of the breakup and the loss of realism in art, uh, some of which is appropriate, obviously, uh, but often the art that you see in museums today or films or music or even literature uh, in some ways celebrates what's pointless for the sake of it being pointless. So we can talk, we could spend a whole course just on literature, but you think of the great novels of the 20th century so-called, whether it's Ulysses, which spends 700 pages on a 24-hour period in the life of an individual on banalities of what he had for lunch. Or uh, you think of what's considered the greatest novel of the 20th century, uh, Faulkner's uh, Sound and Fury. Again, not a classic presentation of a plot with a beginning, middle, and end with heroes fighting against uh, antagonists, but rather just kind of a a, a opaque description of everyday life for its own sake. So we could point to every, in music as well, the same phenomenon of, of a kind of uh, enjoyment of absurdity. And so the good, the true, the beautiful in capital letters is no longer on the agenda for the arts uh, as we see them. So even if you, knew new the if you knew no theology, no history, no philosophy, and just observe the art of the 18th and 19th century and the art of the 20th and 21st century, you'd say something has changed. And a certain hopelessness has been introduced as well. So our culture is post-Christian because it rejects these foundations that I just laid out. For those need, needing further convincing, and, and keep in mind, uh, our YouTube audience is, is now international, I'm happy to tell you. I'm, I am just speaking about the US today, but uh, in different places, uh, it may not be obvious. 
But if you just look at this graph of the question, and this is from Gallup, and the question was asked in three different ways about God, and I'll, I'll show you what each one is. So question A, you have an 80%, 87%, and the question is, do you believe in God, yes or no? And so 87% of the people surveyed said yes. Then they're asked a second question, question B, which is, is, it, is God something you believe in, something you're not sure about, or something you don't believe in? And it falls to 79% when people are given some nuance to answer. And then the question C, it falls to 64% when the question's asked, are you convinced that God exists? Do you think God probably exists, but you have a little doubt? Do you think God probably exists, but you have a lot of doubt? Do you think God probably does not exist? You're not sure? Or you are convinced that God does not exist? The people who said God exists uh, and are convinced of it falls to 64%. So you see how this has occurred over the last know, basically 20 years. If, if we continued on just church membership, uh, do you even affiliate with a denomination? You've seen this was pretty constant for a good uh, 40, 45 years until we get here around 1985, 1990, and it begins to fall until we get to about 47 percent so we now live in a culture, another argument for why it is a post-Christian culture, and, and we should up and down the church understand this, leadership on down, that we live in a post-Christian culture primarily because the majority don't identify with a Christian denomination anymore in any sense. Just uh, the demographic by age group. So if you were born before 1946, 77% down to 66%, a fall of 14%. And through the baby boomers, 13%. Generation X, which is born uh, 65 to 80, 19%. And then our youngest, the millennials, a drop of 29% in terms of changes in church membership. So we, we have a kind of a falling out of the bottom, so to speak, especially among our young people. And not to take us down too far, but uh, if you think about it, if you're a young person, but other age groups as well, <clears throat> one, one measure of cultural decline not only is longevity, how long are people living, which has actually come down in the U.S., but also uh, suicide. And suicides have increased across all age groups by 33%, according to the CDC, from 1999 to 2019. So this decline in belief of God and Judeo-Christian principles and other things um, apparently coincide with this increase in suicide across all age groups. It's the number two reason for death among the 10 to 34 year olds. According to the CDC, you can look this up and, it will and also in your appendix, I provide the, the detailed chart. And interestingly, the CDC also looks at attempts. And if you are a homosexual or gender fluid person in this age range, you have a seven times rate of attempted suicides versus the general population in this age group who attempt suicides number four and five in these age groups. And so what's most visible, and we see this in schools today and in the press, is a post-Christian society is very hard on its weakest, most influential members, namely the young. And the lies and deceit that is told them, uh, whether it's by society or by their schools, is most harmful to a developing person. Not too long ago, uh, an elderly person asked me, Charles, why do the youth, why are they so rude today and not respect their parents or their elders? And I perhaps too quickly said, what is there to respect? And in a way, this raw youthful reaction is a cry for, is this all you're presenting to me is meaningful in life? Life without God? Life without the transcendent? 
So it's almost like a piece of litmus paper uh, that reveals society to itself on how pointless it is. So there's a vacuum, and the vacuum left by Christianity has been replaced by what I call a hostile relativism that deconstructs objective values in exchange for what I've called the cult of the self, the sovereign self, worship of the self, and of course, its appetites. And you hear this all over the place, all things are permitted and then muffled as long as I'm not hurting someone else. Which the philosopher of the 19th century of nihilism, which is a philosophy of the rejection of value. Without God, all things are permitted. So as I mentioned, we have covered up to, the point, up to this point all the pagan practices of, of the ancient world coming up into our own. <coughs> and the Latin there, I just couldn't resist, nihil novi sub soli, nothing new under the sun. So the question of truth once again reasserts itself and the church today, we as Catholics or Christians or Jews, uh, we stand before society today much the same way Christ stood before Pilate when Pilate asked what is truth in a sneering way. So Pilate, a man of his time, member of many pantheons to the gods, Jesus, this criminal from Nazareth, comes along, not terribly impressive, beat up, scourged the night before, and appears before Pilate, you're a king, what is truth? So we are in the same position. <clears throat> the question becomes, how did we get here? How did we get to this place that we're in today? We had such a rich inheritance of the Western culture, Western civilization, and in the span of a few generations, we have in some ways tossed it all away, or ha did it, was it already coming long ago? And so, in this next slide, and I, I did a couple things here. Um, the detail of this slide is in the appendix, because I find if I write too much, the slide gets too busy. <clears throat> so I thought we would just, I would just have a kind of uh, improv uh, of what has gone on over the last, say, 800 years in one slide. <laughs> but, and the schema for this, for the first three, actually came from uh, Pope Benedict's book, Introduction to Christianity, where he's trying to characterize this trajectory in the medieval synthesis, the Enlightenment program, and then uh, Hegel and Marx what I call the kind of final death rattle of the Enlightenment program. So what am I getting at here? If you think about the, the genius of medieval philosophy and theology as it was practiced, let's say, by uh, Thomas Aquinas and his faithful commentators. Keep in mind there were unfaithful commentators in the 13th and 14th century that, that polluted scholastic philosophy. But if you look at this medieval moment this beautiful integration of the best of Greek philosophy with Christian revelation that Aquinas achieved. The question of truth was really what corresponds to our common sense idea of it. Truth is my relationship of my mind to reality. It's a correspondence. So if I say it's 82 miles from here to Chicago, that statement is untrue. Why? because it doesn't correspond to the reality out there that it's only 33 miles from here to Chicago. Uh, and we could give many examples of this, but for the, for the Thomistic group, for medieval theology, truth is a correspondence of my mind to what's out there. And the more I learn about what's out there, the more in possession of truth I am. And all the natural sciences operate this way for the most part. And so, what's controversial about that? N not terribly much. And what Aquinas and Aristotle before him explain is how does that happen? How does that work? And a lot of ink has been written about how the mind abstracts from material reality information. Form is what the word they used. 
by which we abstract and understand the nature of a triangle. Three-sided. And that's good for all triangles. And we begin to classify things that way, and it's a real classification. Okay, so truth is that correspondence. And being is truth in that sense, and which is what uh, Pope Benedict meant. What happened after that, uh, which is not talked about enough, but had a huge influence on what is called modern philosophy, starting with René Descartes, the great mathematician, also meteorologist, was the Protestant Reformation. And one of the linchpins of the Protestant Reformation with Luther was nature is inherently corrupt. It's at war with God's grace. Think of Calvinism, of the predestination of the elect, and God damns the rest, and God despises the rest because of their wickedness, but he saves the elect. Or Luther, where grace doesn't rejuvenate the human person, doesn't renew the human person, doesn't make them beautiful the way grace does in a Catholic understanding, but rather is like snow covering a dung heap or a rider on a horse. The horse is completely passive, and the rider is either God or the devil. So nature and creation are, are, are rejected as revelatory of God's purposes and designs, and can God even work with nature in and of itself? No. And so this is the stage on which modern philosophy begins this rejection of the things out there, of being out there, and knowledge becomes something other than that. What's the famous quote from Descartes? I think, therefore I am. There's a certain, what makes things true is the quality by which they strike my mind. Clear and distinct ideas for Descartes, impressions for David Hume, the empiricist. All your ideas, if they cannot be located in a sensory impression, are not true. And you, we could spend time on each of the philosophers, but the way I'd want to characterize it and the way that uh, Pope Benedict characterized it is that which is made, constructed as a quality of mind, is what is true. So for Aquinas, the mind is a light that discloses the form, information, and in things. It's 35 miles to Chicago. For the moderns, Descartes through Kant, the mind is a mold that construes and certain qualities of how it construes determines what is true. The best example I have found of that is latitude and longitude on the globe. Latitude and longitude do not exist out there. We wouldn't point to a, a portion of the Pacific Ocean and say, oh, that's where 30 degrees is. We wouldn't say it's in the water. But rather, the human mind created a latitude-longitude system imposed it on a muck of the world, not a perfect sphere, but it bends like an orange, to organize, and organize shipping and navigation. Does latitude and longitude exist out there? After a fashion, uh, it's a construction of the human mind, which is attractive, too, because we do this all the time, and even high-level uh, physics does this, too, to make visible other interesting realities in quotes. So the modern posture from Descartes through to Kant is human subjectivity. You know, Kant wouldn't say it's not 35 miles to Chicago, but he says we have a spatial temporal dimension to how our mind works by which we construct that. So the truth is that which is made, constructed, by the mind, with a certain feature of the mind and qualities that we would find noteworthy that these philosophers detail. Why do I call Hegel, and don't worry, we won't get into this too deeply, <laughs> but Hegel and Marx, who is relevant today, and that's why Hegel is relevant, use history, time, temporality as an engine of the mind, capital M, disclosing its categories throughout history and time, through antagonisms. They need 
and in particular Marx needs, antagonisms between classes to get his project off the ground about what is the true uh, movement of the proletariat throughout history and its liberation. And Hegel looked at what went before him and said, why are you making the conditions of mind subjective? That seems arbitrary. So Geist is German for spirit or mind, and he wrote a work which phenomenology of the mind that shows how spirit shows up throughout history. And he believed he was doing a Christian uh, act of disclosing how secular spirit actually Christianity is an example of it. So you see he's inverted the entire thing. Philosophy doesn't exist to disclose Christian revelation. Rather, Christian revelation is an example of mind working through history. Marx will take that, that dialectic, that, that back and forth, and make it a materialism of economic liberation. That's why Marx is called a dialectical materialist which is informing uh, most school curricula throughout our country. So what I'm talking about is not irrelevant. It's just painful. <laughs> so, uh, but keep in mind the mood at the time of modern philosophy from Descartes, say 1620, 1630, 1640, through to the early 19th century, you had massive what are called wars of religion, if you remember from your reading of history. So all throughout the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, people who write history called them wars of religion. They're actually wars of nation states under the guise of religion, if you look at it carefully. You had Catholics and Protestants fighting together against other Catholics, for example. Uh, and so the philosophers of the time were attempting to isolate, are there things we can all agree on philosophically to establish morality, what's true, good, beautiful, and how we order society. Something that would be outside the controversies of the creeds that Catholics fighting Lutherans, fighting Calvins, uh, and Calvinists. So that was the effort. And as we'll see, that has failed miserably. I won't talk about existentialism until later, and it's really a rebellion from a forgetfulness of existence and in particular, the existence of man in his freedom. As uh, Kierkegaard, who's not on the list, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher of the 19th century, said, Hegel builds all these mental castles in the sky, but he lives in the shanty next door. And existentialism was an attempt to restore philosophy to where we all are instead of these technical books that very few people could read and understand. More on that to come, but I thought I, I would mention that. And, but you can see in the seed of existentialism, existentialism is the rise of the irrational. And we'll spend a little more time on that. But we'll return to this. I want to give two examples of what I just talked about in, in terms of this difference between the medieval synthesis and what I call the Enlightenment program. And one is in the idea of causality. Medieval philosophy and the ancients had a much richer idea of causality than we have today, which is largely taken from the natural sciences. So the medieval synthesis identified four causes a formal, material, efficient, and final cause. What am I talking about? If we took the example of a statue, a building, something man has made, and it will be more illustrative than if we pick something from nature, but if we pick a statue, uh, what's, what are the four causes? Well, with the statue, the material cause would be the material out of which it's made, marble, wood, whatever it is. Formal cause is the design. Is it a statue of Jesus? Is it a statue of Socrates, George Washington? The efficient cause is the sculptor, the one who makes the statue using those elements with the design he has in mind. The final cause is why is he making the statue? So if you were thinking of putting a statue in a, in a uh, government building, you might 
well, until a couple of years ago, put a statue of George Washington in that building. So the final cause is patriotism or maybe an educational motto underneath it. The final cause in some ways is the highest cause because it determines the act of the efficient cause, the sculptor. These were the four causes, and you can see their applicability uh, really everywhere, uh, and certainly they were very useful for understanding Catholic theology. God is the efficient and final cause of creation, for example, and everything in it is a formal or material cause. With the modern philosophical project in the Enlightenment, they had no room for and did not want final or formal causes. There are only two types of causes, pushing and pulling causes, efficient causes, and matter. Everything else is metaphysics, not able to be tied to a sensory impression, something that we have as a leftover from the medieval church. So this is one concrete example of I call the disenchantment of nature, of creation, which is part and parcel of today. Creation is opaque to the divine. It's, it's, it is a, a barrier that cannot be crossed over, a veil, uh, a wall. There is no ability to go beyond the here and now in nature. And so that's what I mean by dis nature is no longer sacramental for the modern. It no longer points beyond itself. It might in a kind of prosaic, uh, horizontal way. But that's a beautiful sunset. That's a beautiful forest. But it doesn't go, it's, it's what it stimulates in me that was important, not pointing to anything outside of itself. The natural sciences have worked very well within this model, though they rely on the principles of classical metaphysics. And we pointed this out in other classes. I won't uh, repeat it here. But uh, because of this, because there is no classical metaphysics, they begin to start making claims about, well, the soul is really uh, just neurons firing. Consciousness is just you know, pathways of, of neurons and cells in a particular arrangement. Uh, God is simply a leftover concept, a remainder concept of, for people who need an explanation for why there's something rather than nothing. Again, not to pick on Stephen Hawking, but even in his book, he recognizes that philosophy and the philosophy departments and universities are bankrupt. They have nothing to say. And you know what? He's right. In secular universities, uh, they have nothing to say. So he says it falls to physics to explain origin of the universe, origin of the soul, of free will, which of course there's no such thing as free will for a materialist. So, uh, but what's interesting is these four causes of Thomistic metaphysics are making a comeback, believe it or not, little by little, and I'll just point to two areas quickly, and again they're in the 2018 class, uh, the discovery of DNA. Uh, the genetic code, the sequence of the genetic code being really about biological information, properly sequenced, cannot be the result of a non-directed uh, process working on, you know, natural selection working on random mutations. Mathematically, it's, it's virtually impossible. Uh, and the other one is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, if you think about it, uh, if you looked into this at all. There's a paradox where a beam of light, if you shine it through a, a barrier that has two slits, you get a wave pattern behind it on the wall, which is not what you'd expect. If you were shooting a gun with a bullet through two openings, you'd expect two openings behind the, the intermediate. Wh why is there a wave pattern? But if light is a wave and a particle, this duality uh, is a conundrum, a paradox for physicists today. And what's interesting is how does this introduce the idea of formal causality is that by the act of measuring a photon, you collapse the wave function so you can identify its position. The act of observation informs 
makes real the same way a form in Aristotle and Aquinas worked to make matter the matter of a human being or a squirrel. And so what's interesting is as science progresses, it, it begins to hit up against the wall of these materialistic assumptions and it can't explain them. It certainly can't explain them by material mechanism. So again, we could spend a, an entire summer just on DNA and, and quantum mechanics and how it points to the rich understanding of causality of, of the medievals. And in fact, all science operates out of the assumptions of classical metaphysics, such as regularity in nature, logic, the nature of induction. All that is not based upon an observation. We bring that to experiments. So science can't even establish the methods by which it operates. So uh, that's one example of, of the bankruptcy of the Enlightenment program as it relates to metaphysics. A second example, which is in your appendix as well, or, or the bibliography as a reference, is an interesting article. But again, this fits uh, interestingly with Luther's program of decapitating nature as a basis for God's action in grace, because human nature is inherently corrupt, wicked. In no way does God touch human nature with his divine hand, but rather grace covers us over the way a judge might rule someone uh, and give them a break on a speeding ticket. They did speed, but he gave them a break. God gives us a break. There's nothing in our nature that is lovable or redeemable in itself. And so this rejection of creation, this rejection of nature, showed up in the rejection of another basic tenet of classic metaphysics, which is primary and secondary causes or... Uh, in this example, which I liked because I like to play chess, uh, think of the example of a chess player. Uh, he's the primary cause. The pieces, you know, a bishop moves in a diagonal, rooks move horizontally, vertically, and he's moving the pieces according to their nature. And there are rules to the game, and there's an objective, checkmate, right? And so this is an example of primary and secondary causality in nature. And so, too, God works with us in precisely the same way, in a non-competitive way. Whereas the reformers, Luther and others, and the philosophers of the modern period and beyond thought, well, God is a competitor. The, the more God exists in nature, the less I have to do with anything. And as a result, there was this hollowing out of creation, of nature, not only in the Reformation theologies, where man does nothing, everything is God, but there was also philosophically a hollowing out of reality out there existing in itself and uh, me having the ability to know it in itself. There is no in itself for the modern program. So the results of that is God is absent from nature just as he was for Luther, so too he is for Immanuel Kant, David Hume, Rene Descartes, John Locke, uh, and so forth. Man is passive, which is, you know, the fundamentalisms I'm talking about here. The first one was scientism, where all we have is material reality. The second one is what we would just call Protestant fundamentalism, where uh, not only Bible-only faiths, but uh, human nature is inherently corrupt and everything associated with it. You now see the opening for existentialism. We want to reclaim our humanity, <laughs> our freedom. We, we exist. We are important. But the universe has already been hollowed out. So it's man alone in his freedom, as I put it here. And that's the result. And Pope Benedict expresses this really well, and I've used this in past uh, years, but um, this Enlightenment program to establish what he called the non-controversial claims of Christianity in a safe space uh, through reason alone without appeal to God or Christian revelation um, has been a failure. Let's see how he puts it. Quote, but at this point, speaking as a believer... I should like to make a proposal to those outside the church. 
In the age of the Enlightenment, the attempt was made to understand and define the essential norms of morality by saying that these would be valid even if God did not exist. In the situation of confessional antagonism, the Protestant reformations, the wars of religion, and in the crisis that threatened the image of God, they tried to keep the essential norms of morality outside the controversies and to identify an evidential quality, clear and distinct ideas for Descartes, in these values that would make them independent of the many divisions and uncertainties of the various philosophies and religious confessions. The intention was to guarantee the bases of life and society and more general terms, the bases of humanity. So that was the program. And in some ways, we would wish them well. At that time, this seemed possible since the great fundamental convictions created by Christianity were largely resistant to attack and seemed undeniable in those days. But that is no longer the case. The search for this kind of reassuring certainty, something that could go unchallenged despite all the agreements, has not succeeded. So the Enlightenment program has not succeeded. The attempt carried to the extremes to shape human affairs to the total exclusion of God leads us more and more to the brink of the abyss toward the utter annihilation of man. And he's not particularly just talking about we now have the means of destroying the planet through nuclear weapons, but the abyss that exists in us as individuals, the, the encounter with free falling, whether it's the loss of a job, the, the death of a loved one, uh, the darkness that can take over uh, where we don't know where true north is. He's also referring to the abyss in ourselves. And this is where the effect of the cancellation of class classical metaphysics is most obvious. Man is homeless in a universe that doesn't care about him. He's part, we're told by physics, we're part of a small speck of dust in a very small suburb in a larger galaxy, which is just a small speck of dust, you know, <laughs> and on and on. We, we don't have a spiritual center in the cosmos. We've been untethered, and there's no personal God that we can perceive in this cosmos. <clears throat> Man becomes a stranger to himself and a threat. He can annihilate the world, and he can annihilate himself. And so in freedom, he is faced with this abyss. And man himself becomes a problem to be overcome, deconstructed, which is what we're seeing today in society. Uh, and of course, uh, existential, existentialism has a sense of irony in it too. Is, a, is this an impossible task for man to reclaim his dignity by pulling himself up by his own ears? or as the Romans and Greeks who said it all, uh, compared this dilemma, we think it's a new dilemma, it's not a new dilemma, uh, to uh, man's life is like uh, flowers on a grave, and, which is the nice part, but beneath the grave is a skull grinning back at you. So death faces all of us as a skull grinning back beneath the beautiful flowers of life, whatever we're pursuing in a given moment. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Just quickly though, literature is a good way into this issue because I want to take us all the way down because this is where our culture is as a, as a basis for our evangelical strategy, evangelical in the sense of preaching the gospel. Blaise Pascal, another great Frenchman, uh, noted scientist as well. <coughs> in the pensée, which is French for thoughts. He kind of kept a diary going. <clears throat> man, a man is only a reed, the weakest in nature, but he is a thinking reed. To crush him, the whole universe does not have to arm itself. A mist, a drop of water is enough to kill him. But if the universe were to crush the reed, the man would be nobler than his killer since he knows that he is dying and that the universe has the advantage over him. The universe knows nothing about this. And then later, the eternal silence of these infinity of, of these infinite spaces terrifies me. 
So in his time, more and more is being revealed about the orbits of planets, the, the vast size of the universe. And Earth didn't occupy, in his thinking, the same spiritual center or physical center as it did before. If we fast forward to Alfred Lord Tennyson, who wrote this poem uh, after a, a dear friend of his passed away, uh, quote, man, her last work, who seemed so fair, such splendid purpose in his eyes, who rolled the psalm to wintry skies, who built him fans of fruitless prayer, who trusted God was love indeed, and love's creation final law. Though nature red in tooth and claw, with raven shrieked against his creed. So it's already an animosity between man and creation. Who suffered, who loved, who suffered countless ills, who battled for the true, the just, be blown about the desert dust or sealed within the iron hills, so buried in hills. No more, a monster then, a dream, a discord, dragons of the prime that tear each other in their slime where mellow music matched with him. O oh, life is futile then, as frail. O oh, for thy voice to soothe and bless. What hope of answer or redress? Behind the veil, behind the veil. So you see in the literature, in, in this poem, what existentialist philosophers are lamenting and what they're after. How to reclaim our humanity in freedom when we're surrounded by the utter corruption and discord of life and of nature. Of course, the, the prophet of nihilism, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who, when he was talking about earlier philosophers, he would have the same contempt that we might have for them, probably more. <laughs> but um, not that we have contempt for the earlier philosophers. But he said, they're talking about this, they're talking about that, about how do we parse sense information that we receive. And meanwhile, our planet is breaking forth from its orbit, in, namely the orbit of man from Christianity. But they want to keep parsing verbs and learned papers and books that are difficult. And meanwhile, uh, it's falling apart. So he wrote a poem on this, reflects on a cosmos without pointing, not being sacramental, man alone and homeless, a key theme for him. The crows caw and go with zipping wings to the city. Soon it will be snowing. Happy is he who now yet has a homeland. Now you stand numbly gazing backward. Ah, for how long already? Why, you fool, did you flee into the world as winter approached? The world, a door to a thousand wastelands, silent and cold. He who has lost what you have lost never stops anywhere. Now you stand pallid, cursed to wander in the winter like smoke that is always seeking colder skies. Fly, bird, rasp out your song in the melody of a bird of the waste. Hide, you fool, your bleeding heart in ice and sneers. The crows caw and go with zipping wings to the city. Soon it will be snowing. Woe is he who has no homeland. We'll keep rolling. Uh, Francis Thompson, who wrote the poem The Hound of Heaven, which is in the back of the breveries of all priests, is the description of someone like a St. Augustine who was a playboy and got, uh, he was a medical doctor who would prescribe himself dope and other drugs, and he eventually uh, died, young age, and this poem was found in his pocket. And the poem describes all of his evasions of this hound of heaven, who is God, who pursues him. And one of the stanzas he talks about is how we will evade God by jumping into nature and its delights. So I, in their delicate fellowship was one. I'm one with nature. Drew the bolt of nature's secrecies. I knew all the swift importings on the willful face of skies. I knew how the clouds arise. Spoon to the wild sea snortings, all that's born or dies. I triumphed and saddened with all weather. Heaven and I wept together. And its sweet tears were salt with mortal mine. Against the red throb of its sunset heart, 
I laid my own to beat and share commingling heat. <clears throat> but not by that, by that was ease my human smart. In vain my tears were wet on heaven's gray cheek. For ah, we know not what each other says. These things and I, in sound I speak, their sound is but their stir. They speak by silences. Nature, poor stepdame, cannot slake my drought. Pascal describes the same thing, and he used the expression in the pensée, the earth lickers. Those who are attached to the earth and its appetites and their appetites and goodies uh, find their destruction in that embrace. Of course, the, the master of, of all of this, of, of this nihilism, uh, is Shakespeare. And um, I cannot help but not read this to you. Everyone knows the first sentence, but no one really follows what comes after. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consumption, devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep. To kill himself, in other words. To sleep, perchance, to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes life calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes? when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin, a knife, killing himself. Who would Fardell's bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? In other words, in a long life, we put up with all of these setbacks, only now to kill myself? But that dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have then to fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. He's talked himself out of it. You know, one of the roles of literature is to experience deep, extreme emotions vicariously, safely. And part of the role of literature for the youth is exactly that, that whatever you are feeling has been experienced and expressed beautifully by those who went before. And when we have stopped teaching literature like this in schools, you can see how someone who's lonely, who thinks no one understands what I'm going through, or what I've gone through. Uh, literature, in some ways, can speak uh, in a way a friend cannot. And of course, uh, Macbeth, which of course, this uh, scene from Macbeth was, the line from was taken from the, the greatest poem in, in the US, uh, Sound and Fury. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools that way to dusty death. Out, out brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So I think that's my last one, yes. So, but you see, and I'm, this is just a sample, uh, but imagine if we taught this once again in our schools. Think of the great conversations you can have safely uh, with students 
uh, about what they're experiencing, as well as adults uh, educating themselves. But this encounter with nothingness is in our culture today. And to summarize then, uh, and now turning you know, briefly here, the features of our post-Christian culture are we are alone in a universe that doesn't care about us. So what we have left is our self in freedom to create a life project. So the ancient Gnostics would appeal to the God beyond creation for meaning. Today, our culture appeals to the God of the self who's beyond matter. The self hasn't quite been reduced yet to matter in our culture. It's, it escapes being uh, deconstructed into just chemical and material reactions. But for the French deconstructionists, you can say when you go home tonight, we heard about French deconstructionists, <laughs> who are informing our educational system. Uh, in particular, Gilles Deleuze, not a, a household name for sure, but He's showing up in your classroom every day, every week, of your children or your grandchildren. He said the self ultimately is a bourgeois concept. What's real is desire. And the flow of desire. And uh, Penguin uh, came out not too long ago with uh, translations of two of his works, which I had the joy of reading. Uh, but... Uh, this idea that the self is porous, liquid, you'll hear that expression, the liquid self, it's all about appetite. It's all about desire. And desires don't have to have meaning. They just flow, is what he says. And lest you think this is some crackpot, uh, Etienne Gilson, who some of you maybe know of, who was probably one of the greatest Thomistic philosophers of the 20th century said Gilles Deleuze was his best student who understood Aquinas best of all the students he had. Now Gilles Deleuze eventually tossed himself out of his condo window in Paris and killed himself. Uh, but uh, the self is not real. It's merely the occasion of desire. So uh, this is what's driving uh, much of the educational establishment as it relates to sexual ed uh, and these other uh, topics that are happening today in school. Next one, nature is opaque. Creation uh, is not revealing of anything related to God's design. It's just there, suitable for scientific progress, inventing gadgets, and then appeals to the transcendent are a cop-out for weaklings. Christians are weaklings and mentally deficient, actually, because they have to appeal to Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny to justify uh, the pangs of life. So you see, with ancient Gnosticism, how it's reappeared. We've come full circle. The dualism of the human person. My body is mere matter. I know some of you, because you email me about it, have uh, children and grandchildren who are in alternative sexual lifestyles. And the arguments, the, and it's obviously uh, a concern and causes anguish. And the arguments that are made against homosexuality fall on deaf ears, on homosexual conduct, I should be precise. Uh, and because appeals to natural law, the natural order of human sexuality, have no uh, impact. Why? Because we already have a prior commitment to a dualism. My body is not the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a temple of my desires, my agenda, myself. So why on earth would I be swayed by arguments uh, about how human sexuality fits in with a broader plan of God and of the natural law and of marriage, which is a divine institution in the Christian understanding. You see, when, if you enter the argument or the discussion with uh, someone who has a same-sex attraction, for example, those arguments 
don't have the impact because they've already have a prior commitment to the dualism. My true self is spiritual. What I do with my body is just a means to my true spiritual self. So perhaps one of our evangelical strategies is to start there, that God created us as a unity, a body-soul unity. I'm as much the soul of my body as I am the body of my soul. And God made it good. So we've come full circle. And so with that, one last slide of kind of bad news. <laughs> I think, yes. And then one poem, I guess. <laughs> but as I call it, once the syrupy consolations of desire, nature, doubling the dose, uh, kind of withdraw, because they inevitably do, our boredom, world weariness, and despair follow. What's interesting in our culture, and this happened in the Roman culture, was in order to uh, manage our boredom, our despair, our wealth, we choose greater and greater atrocities to, as I put it, punctuate our existence and manage our desperation. G.K. Chesterton, who many of you are familiar with, wrote about this in his work, The Everlasting Man. Quote, The psychology of it is really human enough to anyone who will try that experiment of seeing history from the inside. There comes an hour in the afternoon when the child is tired of pretending, when he is weary of being a robber or a red Indian. It is then that he torments the cat. <laughs> there comes a time in the routine of an ordered civilization when man is tired of playing. The effect of this staleness is the same everywhere. It is seen in all drug taking and dram drinking and every form of the tendency to increase the dose. Men seek stranger sins or more startling obscenities as stimulants to their jaded sense. They seek after mad oriental religions for the same reason. They try to stab their nerves to life if it were with the knives of the priests of Baal. They are walking in their sleep and try to wake themselves up with nightmares. It's a very artful way of describing our current situation and the atrocities we see every day in culture and in the news. So one last, just to make our situation as desperate as possible, but W.H. Auden, in 1947, post-World War II, made the observation in, in, the, in a poem, The Age of Anxiety, or that was the collection of the works. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. So this cult, I call it, of the self is revealing itself also as an embrace of the diabolic. And what I mean by that is, you think of the scene recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of Jesus and depending on which gospel, the Gadarene demoniac or the Gerasene demoniac where he confronts a man possessed by the devil who could not be restrained. Strong men could not hold him down. He broke his chains. He, he lived in the tombs. And this was in the region of the Decapolis, which was a Greek section of the Middle East. And Jesus uh, is approaching him, and the possessed man sees Jesus in the distance and says, what do you have to do with me? You're the Son of God. The devils always knew who Jesus was, and he's always shushing them to be quiet, especially in Mark's Gospel. Jesus asks him, what is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. The essence of the diabolic, is the breakdown of unities, body and soul unity, husband and wife unity, citizen and country. And if you look at the origin of the word diabolic, it comes from a Greek merging of dia and boline. Boline is a Greek verb meaning to throw. It's where our word ballistic comes from, 
or ball. <laughs> and dia means to throw apart. Dia is a prefix meaning to tear asunder. The essence of the diabolic is to destroy natural unities. And in scripture, the other essence of the diabolic is hatred of the cross. Christ rebuked Peter when he tried to tempt him from the cross. Get behind me, Satan. The three temptations of Christ. Turn these, bre these stones into bread. Be an economic liberator, not a spiritual liberator from sin. Throw yourself off the top of the uh, temple. You know, be a miracle worker. Do something that makes the crowd go, ooh. Or just fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms. These three temptations from his ministry, death and resurrection, make up the other aspect of the essence of the demonic. Diabaline, a tearing asunder of natural unities and hatred of the cross. And so with that, let's, let's talk about how a restoration continues. But the choices are clear. One of the nice things about today is the choices are clear. Either godless autonomy and destruction, and again, if anyone's debating that, we can go back to the suicide slide again, or liberated dependency, non-competitive cooperation with God and joy, self-made certain lies, or this mysterious sweet summons of a person, Jesus Christ, who is truth, love, beauty, the way, the truth, and the life. So as Catholics seeking to transform culture, we live in this hope the victory has been won. We merely have to apply in our lives what Jesus Christ has won through his death and resurrection. The Mass is the sacramental representation of Calvary. Jesus is dying and rising. Jesus is torn asunder at the consecration. The bread is consecrated separately from the wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So we are witnessing in a, non in a sacramental way the crucifixion of Jesus and the empty tomb. This is our victory, and this is the basis of our hope. So hope is not, and I hate to be raw, hope is not things will get better or God will cure me of my cancer. Our hope is in eternal life and the transformation that makes here and now, starting now. Now God does cure people of cancer. God does help you find that new job. But to reduce our hope to optimism is a betrayal of what the theological virtue of hope is. How did Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, talk about this? As I mentioned, he wrote a work called Crossing the Threshold of Hope in 1994. And it was startling because an interviewer sent him by mail a list of questions on a wing and a prayer, hoping maybe the Pope will respond or at least I'll get a letter from his secretary saying, thank you for your questions. Here is a rosary card. And that would be the end of it. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with rosary cards. Please don't email me. But the Pope, after several months, replied back in a, an envelope. Uh, and on the cover of the envelope, he wrote out the title, Cross, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. And there are many questions asked in this, and I'll just read the ones I think are most relevant for us now. The interviewer, if God exists, why is he hiding? Isn't the objection of many people yesterday as today quite understandable? Why doesn't he reveal himself more clearly? Why doesn't he give everyone more tangible and accessible proof of his existence? Why does his mysterious strategy seem to be that of playing hide-and-seek with his creatures? John Paul II responds, 
Could God go further in his stooping down, in his drawing near to man, thereby expanding the possibilities of our knowing him? In truth, it seems that he has gone as far as possible. He could not go further. In a certain sense, God has gone too far. Didn't Christ perhaps become a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles? Precisely because he called God his Father, because he revealed him so openly in himself, could not but elicit the impression that it was too much. Man was no longer able to tolerate such closeness, and thus the protest began. You might remember when I was reading from Pope Benedict's earlier works on God made himself in Jesus Christ too vulnerable to the point that we could kill him. And did he not in some ways love us too much? Continuing, the interviewer asked, may I ask, have you ever once hesitated in your belief in your relationship with Jesus Christ and therefore with God? <clears throat> John Paul II responds, your question is infused with both a lively faith and a certain anxiety. I state right from the outset, be not afraid. This is the same exhortation that resounded at the beginning of my ministry in the See of St. Peter when he came out on the balcony as the new pope one of the first things he said to the crowd, be not afraid. Christ addressed this invitation many times to those he met. The angel said to Mary, be not afraid. The same was said to Joseph, be not afraid. Christ said the same to the apostles, to Peter in various circumstances, and especially after his resurrection. He kept telling them, be not afraid. He sensed, in fact, that they were afraid. They were not sure if they, if they, who they saw was the same Christ they had known. They were afraid when he was arrested. They were even more afraid after his resurrection. The words Christ uttered are repeated by the church. And with the church, they are repeated by the Pope. I have done so since the first homily I gave in St. Peter's Square. Be not afraid. These are not words set into a void. They are profoundly rooted in the gospel. They are simply the words of Christ himself. Of what should we not be afraid? We should not fear the truth about ourselves. Do not be afraid of God's mystery. Do not be afraid of his love. And do not be afraid of man's weakness or his grandeur. Do not be afraid of God who became a man. Great stuff. People and nations of the entire world need to hear these words. Their conscience needs to grow in the certainty that someone exists who holds in his hands the destiny of this passing world. Someone who holds the keys to death in the netherworld. Someone who is the alpha and omega of human history, be it the individual or human history. And this someone is love. Love that became man. Love crucified and risen. Love unceasingly present among men. It is Eucharistic love. It is the infinite source of communion. He alone can give the ultimate assurance when he says, be not afraid. It is very important to cross the threshold of hope, not to stop before it, but to let oneself be led. And he finishes with a, a brief poem, not with the cross of the Savior behind you, but with your own cross behind the Savior. So with that, uh, I threw a lot at you this evening. But we ended on a hopeful note, I hope. I, I took you to the brink, <laughs> like boot camp, broke you down. But our hope is assured and these beautiful words of John Paul II, I hope, serve as an inspiration for you. Questions or comments? Yes. Well, to me, the problem is that was 30 years ago, and I don't know what has gone on with the Catholic Church, especially this latest last 18 months. Question. I think what's important, though, because we've had two uh, heartfelt questions that 
are coming from a, a, a dark place is um, we are not called to this kind of success. I would love for this kind of success. I would love a 1950s, and I'm not saying this disparagingly, full classrooms. Uh, you know, if you go to the seminary, and every year they have the class photos of the, of the seminarians who are being ordained priests. And you walk through the 30s, the 40s, the huge classes, 40, 50 men being ordained per year. And there's something majestic about it. And, and now we're ordaining five, six. Uh, but though that is wonderful, it's also a museum piece. I, it has no, I, I have no interest in it. We should be interested in the here and now and not some nostalgia because, but we're not, you have to internalize we're not living in a Christian culture. And, and it's hard to internalize that for the reasons you mentioned, Dan. We grew up in a Christian culture of sorts, although Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973. However, um, that's gone. And, and we have to acknowledge it's gone. And so, yes, I would love for there not to be another lockdown. I would love for religious instruction in public schools to resemble something uh, sane and healthy. But that's not the culture we're living in. And so I'm not going to lament that very long. A little, but not very long. It's what we can do about it from this spiritual perspective. Because this is hearts and minds at the, at the retail level. I mean, the communists knew this when they went into Latin America and Nicaragua. They weren't trying to change big policy ideas. They, they instituted something called Comunidade de Base, base communities, little groups of 10, 15 people. Start another group of 10, 15 people. Now, you start another group of 10, 15 people. And they turned several countries communist by taking this on the ground retail approach, much like we're, we're trying to do today, or groups throughout the country, whether they're Catholic or evangelical, meeting in small groups to build each other up for action in the tasks at hand. So that's the way this can go, and this is what Pope Benedict talked about, that the church is going to get smaller, and it's going to be revitalized the result, as a result. And there are precedents for this. The remnant, as I said in another class, always rejuvenates the whole. And we're going through one of these periods. And we shouldn't place ourselves on a knife's edge because your individual salvation doesn't rest on uh, what the curriculum is at New Trier. Next question. Right. Yep. And look at the history of the church throughout time of the tremendous crises that the church had to endure, whether it was in the, say, 14th, 15th century, three people claiming to be pope at the same time, <laughs> to the persecutions in various countries, uh, Asia, Eastern Europe, the underground church in China. Um, if they were gathered here, they might have a few <laughs> criticisms, too, of leadership. Um, but not to dwell on that too much because we probably have been through the same or worse in other moments of our history. So that's why I think the communion of saints is an important concept for us now when we're feeling isolated, uh, is that the communion of saints through time and history, whether it's dear friends who have passed away, family members, or saints that we have affection for, uh, can be quite useful and helpful to us in our prayer, I believe, because they have faced this throughout time and history and overcame it. doesn't mean they were successful. It means they overcame it spiritually. And uh, often the church enjoyed secular success. But we're being purified now. The church perhaps uh, has relied on too much of the uh, trappings of the world 
uh, and needs to be purified so that the real spiritual substance of the gospel can be released. Are we too encased in the materialism of our time uh, and has that compromised the church and are we being pruned like a tree uh, so that we can be revitalized and grow properly?